mentioned last week, and just submitted this assignment, you covered a whole lot of work. What in your mind are some of the major points we learned last time? Last week, I should say. Talk to the person next to you, scan back through your notes. What do you think in the notes last week was one of the most important things that we worked on? Okay, so any suggestions? From the assignment perhaps, what is the topic that you think was most important? Partial fractions, we didn't really cover in class, but it was in the tutorial. Okay, so it's a big pass. Okay, so partial fractions is passing. Okay, Institute of Chemical Engineering magazine. So they published this 
Because magazine has a way to keep engineers who are in industry up to date with what they should have learned to undergraduates as well as new developments since they graduated. So let's just take a look at this. This article is all about how you select instruments for the process. How the measurement works. It's the title of the article and it talks about not to do the economic evaluation for a census. We'll cover this next year before end. I will go through some of these examples with you. Uh, but take a look here, it's quite interesting. All the processes are very, yeah, this is expressed in transfer function notation as GP of S is equal to a gain multiplied by a dead time, we'll learn about dead time later this week, divided by a time constant times S plus 1. Okay. I go on and talk about how you can determine this transfer function. We're going to look at that in a week and a half from now. We're going to say, what if I don't know my process model, can I still use this transfer function? Because this transfer function is so central to everything we do. So I want you to kind of say, okay, let's invest a little bit of time, get past the man, a little flash chunk into something that you're very comfortable with, in fact. None of you have had any real problem with it in tutorials. But we do need to understand how to read that transfer function when we see it. Okay, so today's class is going to guide you through a bit of that. And you know, we'll see it in every class from now on. We're going to learn something about that transfer function how to use it. So hope that helps to emphasize the importance of this uh, because it has good, good applicability. So let's go back to where we were last year. And on Friday, we have ended the class on Friday by looking at the tank system. So let's just quickly read all that. So I, I like, I will have the tendency to use one example and carry it through for a while because we get into it, we get a good understanding and develop some of the theory that we need. So today's class, I'm going to use the theory of the tank system, for the example of the tank system, to develop some theory. So what we had, we call, we had an inlet flow F0, height in this tank, H1, and that flow leaves the tank through a valve. That valve presents some resistance to the flow leaving. So this flow leaving, F1, is in fact H1 divided by R. Someone asked me last week, well, what is R? R is a resistance. It is a feature of the valve. If you change the valve, R changes. This valve presents resistance so that the flow leaving is proportional to the height in the tank. The valve with lower resistance will allow a faster flow through the that through that pipe. Okay, so then this flow leaves, the valve enters a second tank. The second tank is the same, in fact, as the previous tank, same area. Its height is H2 though, and again, there's another valve in the part leaving the tank, so that F2 is equal to H2 over R. The same valve type is used so that we have the same R value. And if you recall in that last week, we present, uh, we derived the transfer function for the height in the tank, H1, as a function of the flow in. So let me just quickly rewrite that transfer function over here. So it's the same bell, it's the same R. So it's not R1, it's the same R. And recall then, we said the flow 1 leaving derived in terms of H1 in deviation variables divided by F0 in deviation So there's my output in the numerator, is the height, divided by the input. So I'm essentially modeling what is the effect of this flow in on the height in the first time, H1. And our derivation last week for that was input to R divided by R times A plus one. That was my transfer function that describes the system. And you will recall that we said that this was a first order system because the differential equation for that height in the tank 
related to the flow if it's a first order ODE. And we said then last week, <coughs> if I make a change as follows to this inlet flow, let's consider F0 here, F0 comes and I make a step in of F0, so this is F0 dash as a function of my home. What we were interested in last time was what is the response to that inlet, or to that input. So if I change F0 in a stepwise manner, we derive the transfer function for that. So let's just do a recap there of that F0 dash of S is equal to 1 over S for a unit step. And if we make a, a different step size, we say that F0 dash of S is P over S for a step of size P. So a unit step is 1 over S, a uh, step input of a different magnitude, P for example, is P over S. Okay, so P can be positive, P can be negative, you can step up or down by any magnitude. And what you do then is, once you know what F dash 0 of S is, you can bring it over here to the right hand side and multiply that transfer function so that you can calculate H1 dash of S. Okay, and we, we did that last time in fact, and we said that H1 dash of S, if we plot that, would show that we're initially going flat line, and the moment that that step occurs, we see a rise and we head off to steady state. That's the classic first order response that we covered last time. So the height of the tank will rise gradually to some new steady state value. Everyone comfortable with this? Black curve is the response H1 dash T. So that's going to be the height in my tank over here. If I make that corresponding change to the input X0. Okay. Are you Just so that you can see them side by side. There would be two different axes. I just want you to see if that curve coordinated. And this is going to be typical. We're often graph in the same axis, and we do this because we're in deviation variance. And so we're, we're taking away the steady state, and we simply will often overlay the, the manipulated variable or the input variable related to the output. Okay. Anything else? You must be really comfortable with this. This is simply a recap of all of that. Okay. Then we, we call up the idea and say, well, if you, if you want to understand what's going on here at the flow, we can simply use this equation. F1 is equal to H1 over R. And you'll recall then F1 dash, we derive the Laplace transfer function of F1 dash S as a function of H1 dash S. So given this input H1, now H1 is my input driving the flow here with my output. We derive that transfer function, and in fact, it was simply 1 over r. And we call that a pure gauge. And then we said at the end of Friday's class, well, if we want to define a transfer function that goes from F0, my input, F0, to flow F1, we can simply multiply these two time functions. And so my goal is to find flow out as my output, the different line flow in as my input, and a single transfer function for that, which is the product of the two transfer functions. So F1 dash of S divided by H1 dash of S multiplied by H1 dash of S as a function of the flow. So those H1 dashes cancel and we're left with what we expect on the left hand side. If you sub in what the two terms are, it's 1 over R 
multiplied by r divided by r a s plus one, and that simplifies a little bit to a single value in the numerator, unity in the numerator divided by r a s plus one. Okay, so that's a pure recap of Fridays. Now I want to just take a little bit of time and uncover what this means over here. So that is <coughs> over there in the green box. Let's see this over here. So let me just try to rewrite it for, for you. It's equal to 1 in the numerator divided by R A S plus 1. Take a minute to <coughs> tell me what you think the response F1 dash is going to look like given a step input in F0. <coughs> this is F0 <coughs> as a function of time. What is going to be the response <coughs> for F1? Okay, so let me ask it this way, uh, just depending to where I want to go with this. Let's say this system over here takes five minutes to reach the new height. So steady state reaches after about five minutes. Given an input F0 as an output H1. So about five minutes to reach a new steady state. If I make that same input F0 over here, how long is it going to take for F1 to reach a new state? 25 minutes? Long, let's ask it this way. Is it going to take a longer time to reach steady state? Is it going to take a shorter time? Okay, we can rule out a shorter time from cause and effect. Right? Took a shorter time, we've got something wrong happening there. Um, is it going to take the same time as our option, or is it going to take a longer time? For F1. Here's the head. exactly the same time because F1 is equal to H1 divided by R. So whatever H1 is, F1 is exactly going to have that same shape in time, just scaled by a different constant, 1 over R. Okay. So it's not a trick question, it's simply indicating our understanding of the dynamics. <coughs> that this time duration to reach the new steady state for F1 dash is going to be the same as it takes for H1. Now, a few people understand this intuitively, and, and this, that seemed like a stupid question to ask. But I'm going through this deliberately slowly so that any misconceptions get cleared up. This is important to understand. And one way you could see that answer, that it's going to take the same amount of time, is by comparing the two transfer functions. Let's take a look here. Here's the transfer function that we were discussing over here. It was R divided by RAS plus 1. That's a function that tells you what the height is if I change the input at 0. Let's take a look at this transfer function here. This transfer function tells me what the flow out is if I change the input. So the same input is being changed at 0 dash in both cases. It's just a different output. And notice here, the only difference between these two transfer functions is that numerator, R, in the one case, and unity in the other case. The time constant is RA, and that's what determines that dynamics. Okay, so RA is telling me how fast this rises. If 
doesn't tell me where it's going to land up. That's the numerator's job, is where is it going to land up. But the speed with which it goes up and that shape of the curve is given by the denominator, Ra. And we call this our time constant. We said last class we want shorter time constants, if possible. Systems with shorter time constants are desirable because we can see the output effect much sooner. Okay, so if you wanted a shorter time constant for this system, one option you had is to go change the valve. Use a valve with less resistance so that any change in the input flow is immediately seen in output flow or, or seen a lot faster. Okay, so you go change your valve to one with a smaller R. If I use a smaller R, this time constant RA increases and then I get a faster response. So I can't go change my tank's area. A is fixed, the tank area is fixed, but I can go change R. It's a whole lot cheaper to change R so I can increase my time constant. So let's uh, just state some general principles here from this discussion. The first one is that we can combine systems in series and find an overall transfer function for that system. So here's a general rule. Systems in series can be combined to find an overall transfer function for the system. This is important for us, this is an important idea because many of our chemical engineering processes are simply systems in a series. You take a feed, put it through a heat exchanger, put it into a mixing tank where another stream mixes with it, put that into a distillation pump. So you've got three units in series over there. Okay. And you've got the transfer function for one of the systems, uh, sorry, for each of the systems separately, and you can combine them and create an overall transfer function. So this is the idea. So you take some input, S, into your first system, we'll use this general notation G1. So that's the transfer function for that system, for that process. This might be a heat exchanger, might be a valve, might be a mixing tank. And then we're going to get some output from that system. So output one as a function of S. This will go into a second process, G2, okay, from which we get another output. Okay, so what I would, quickly also what we'd like to introduce while we're on this topic of notation and ideas here, let's just show that some other textbooks will use different notation depending on if you're using Seabold or Marlin, the input will often be U of S, and the outputs will be called Y of S. So Y1 of S, Y2 of S. Like the typical notation you see in other places. And with that idea then, what we're saying is an overall transfer function for the system can be found. <coughs> which is the product of the two individual transfer functions. <coughs> so my overall transfer function then is just simply G of S. And that's equal to G1 of S times G2 of S. G1 of S is equal to Y1 of S is my output as a function of U of S, the input. And G2 
of s is y2 of s as a function of y1. So I'm simply substituting in what g1 of s is. g1 of s is my transfer function for that first system. g1 of s then can also be expressed as the output y1 of s divided by input u. Similarly for g2. g2 is the output y2 divided by the input y1. So if I substitute each of those individually, that overall transfer function is, shows that the y1s will cancel, is intermediate, and you're left with y2 of s as an input of u of s. So that's my overall transfer function from the first input right to the last output. If I have three systems in series, or four or five, I can do this. Just keep chaining them up and multiplying the transfer functions. I will put this in. Are we going to use this in this issue? I tend to, I use most of the notation from Dr. Martin, but I might periodically use this as well. I know a number of you are using this in your so I'll use this in your textbook. Find for me, use this idea, find the transfer function for the flow rate out F2 of S as a function of the first input flow rate F0 of S. Recognize that this flow rate out F2 over here is got several systems in series. The first is F0 to H1, which we've covered, and it's H1 to F1, which we've also covered. So this flow rate F1 now is an input into the second tank. The second tank is the same shape and geometry and same R value, in fact, as the first tank. 
So that's one nice thing about transfer functions is once you've derived it for one system, we can go reuse it again for the other system. So they save us a bit of time that way. So the transfer function, we can write then for H2 dash of S for an input F1 dash of S. That transfer function is in fact the same as this one over here. The height one as a function of the flow zero is the same as height two over flow one. H2. So yeah, I'm just breaking it down for all the steps so that we can see them individually. So H2 is a function of S then is equal to R divided by RAS. And then finally, the transfer function relating F2 to H2, F2 to H2 is equal to 1 over R. <coughs> so four transfer functions here in series, we change them up. We can write that as F2 dash of S divided by H2 dash of S. I'm just going really slowly here so we, we understand where this all comes from. Because for now, we won't go through this painstaking detail, but for now, uh, let's, let's be clear. This flow rate 2 is my output, the input is H2 multiplied by what is H2 now as my output as the input is F1. F1 is a got a transfer function then that relates it to H1. And then finally H1 is a transfer function related to the input F0. So I often work backwards from where I want to be at F2. This is what I want in my numerator here at the end. And I'll work backwards to get my denominator in the flow sheet. Okay, so there's a whole lot of intermediate cancellation here that occurs. So then, sub subbing in each one of those four transfer functions, we can simplify it and get the overall transfer function. So finally we can say F2 dash of S over F0 dash of S is 1 over R <coughs> multiplied by R adding S plus 1 multiplied by 1 over R again for that vowel multiplied by R over R S plus 1. Okay, so four systems in series. So what I want to just emphasize here is that that is the valve. The 1 over R represents the valve. This 1 over R represents the valve again. So this is the second valve over here. That's the transfer function for that valve. This is the transfer function for the valve. This is the transfer function for tank 2. This is the transfer function for tank 1. Four systems in series are multiplied out. And then we can summarize that all, simplify, the R's cancel out, and I'm left with 1 over R and S plus 1 squared. And we'll call this a second order system. Then the detailed reasoning for being called a second order system is something I'll cover in Wednesday's class. But it's intuitive why it's that. It's simply because it's the product of two first order systems in series that we get a second order system overall. But oh, there's a bit more specific detail on that that we'll talk about in Wednesday. So we'll, we'll be using this idea of multiplication 
uh, coming up quite, quite a bit uh, two years from now. So let me uh, shift gears a little bit and let's talk about a different topic and how we deal with non-linear systems. Uh, talk a little bit more about second order systems on Wednesday. I'm going to let that rest in your mind for now. And you can make sure you understand it before we go on and build up on top of that on Wednesday. This is another thing you'll notice in my courses. I will often come back to previous topics we covered, giving you some time to build up that understanding. So if you didn't quite get it in today's class, Rather than you just simply continuing and building up on it, give you a day or two to go back, watch the videos, recap the ideas, so that when you see it again on Wednesday's class, your, your foundation is solid, so we can build up on it. There's no point in continuing to build on something that you're not sure of. So let's move to a different topic, and that's nonlinear systems. And let me introduce yes. Okay, this is a question that you can you can answer yourself. We'll look at this on Wednesday. What is the shape of the screen light going to be? H2. Is it going to be like that? Is it going to be like that? Is it going to be like that? Okay. So very easy to go simulate a mathematical trial. We'll, we'll look at, at what this is on Wednesday's class. So leave it to you to okay, well. It's a good question. Okay, so nonlinear systems, let's let's consider it this way. If we were modeling the height of the tank H1 by T, and we know that that's the flow out minus the flow in. I'm sorry, flow in minus flow out. What if that flow out was we considered this before? So let's take a look here before I modify what's up on the board. Let's pay attention here. So the height in the tank is equal to flow in minus flow out. But many valves, in fact, don't follow this dynamics. The dynamics are actually what we call square root dynamics. It's a nonlinear relationship. We don't have a flash transforms for that sort of nonlinearity. So we need to deal with that. And the way we deal with it is a technique that you've seen in your math course, you've seen it with Dr. Adams, and that's the Taylor series expansion. We'll expand a nonlinear function through its Taylor series to get a linear representation of it. And then we're good to go with the last track So let's, let's uh, put a bit of theory up here. So in general, if f of x is nonlinear, so in this case f of x is simply that square root of h, if that's nonlinear, <coughs> use the Taylor series expansion. And you'll recall that the Taylor series is a way to linearize a function around a given point. That was always the crucial part of the Taylor series. So you have to have some baseline about which you linearize it. And in our case, that baseline point we were going to linearize around, the most natural point to select is the steady state value of the process. So recall in the Taylor in the, the class transforms. We said our system was initially at steady state. That's going to be the point where we choose to linearize about. And the way we'll do that is by writing f of x then is equal to f of x at steady state. So x s. We will take the first derivative of df by dx and evaluate that derivative when x is equal to the steady state, and multiply by x minus xx. So that's the Taylor series expansion to the first order term. Then there's a second order term and a third order term. So I'll just simply call it one order to get a plus higher order terms. 
So that's an exact equality. It's f of x is exactly equal to this because there's all these higher order terms that can go high enough that this is We'll start at the first order because we want to linearize this. If I go to the higher order term, I get quadratics and cubics, which are nonlinear, so that defeats the purpose of what I'm doing. We'll simply stop at the first order terms. And what I would like to point out here is that that first term is a constant. So this f of x evaluated at x is simply a constant number. So it's simply plug in steady state value into the function n. This term over here, this portion of it, I should say, is constant. That's simply the first derivative evaluated at the steady state point. And there's something interesting about that last part of the second term. It's a deviation there. So, we know how to work with that already, so that's going to be easy. And that's all the theory you need to know. Right? Then we just go back to how we've used these systems already. You simply replace the non-linear version of, of the function with that linear version of it. And we simply say that it's an approximation if we ignore the higher order terms. So let's see how we might apply it to this case. Here's my nonlinear differential equation. Let me um, isolate the nonlinearity for you so that you can see and work with this one a little easier. So let's write it as follows. Let's multiply through by r. So r times h times to r times f0 minus the square root of h. I just want to emphasize the nonlinear term on its own for now, just to make it a little easier. So in this example then, root h is my nonlinear term. So I'm going to call that, that's my f of x. In this general theory of the Taylor series expansion, f of x is my nonlinear function. In this example, f of x is equal to square root of x. So go ahead and expand root h into a constant plus a constant multiplied by a deviation term. Give that a go. Be a constant plus a constant multiplied by the deviation at steady state. Well, my function is square root of h. So at steady state, that would be hx square root. So that's my first part of that expansion. The second part of the expansion says, take the derivative with respect to x and substitute it for value when x is the steady state value. 
So what's the derivative of the square root of h? Okay. Uh, so in other words, what is it? saying is simply take that derivative and evaluate it when h is at its steady state value. So that's minus a half times the square root of hs in the denominator. Okay, so that's the, that's the first part. That's a constant value. If I know hs, that simply reduces down to constant. Okay, three questions. Yep. And, um, why is it minus? Okay, so there's my constant, and then multiply by the deviation variable. Well, the deviation is simply h minus hs. <coughs> so anytime you encounter a nonlinear term in your in your ODE, isolate it if possible, and then do the Taylor series expansion around the steady state. And you'll get two terms, one constant plus a constant multiplied by the deviation variable. The second constant often takes a little bit more work because you have to find the derivative with respect to the nonlinear variable. So now we have that. Okay, so simply in this ODE, Whenever I see square root h, I can simply go replace it by that new nonlinear approximation. So I can write root hs plus 0 0.5 divided by square root of hs multiplied by h minus hs. So I'll simply go make that change and replace the square root by that new expansion. There's my ODE, it's linear. I can go take the steady state, subtract, and then just take the apart. Sometimes we fall into this mistake. That's not necessary. <coughs> this variable x represents any nonlinear variable you encounter in your own. <coughs> so you'll have some practice in this tutorial. And 